Tom is the founder and principal of Tom Wiskum Architecture. He has published texts on architectural theory in journals such as AD, Project, and Log. His work is part of the permanent collection of the Frack Center Paris, the Art Institute of Chicago, SF MoMA, and New York MoMA. Icon Magazine, in its May 2009 issue, named Tom one of the top 20 architects in the world who are making the future and transforming the way we work. Tom is currently planning and designing the old Bank District Museum that is set to be built in downtown Los Angeles. Tom is a senior faculty member at SciArc, where he has taught for over 10 years, and is the newly appointed undergraduate chair. Tom has been a visiting professor at the University of Pennsylvania and Yale University. Introducing Tom is no simple task, as he is no simple architect, but here is a quick attempt at it. How do you challenge ground without challenging gravity? How do you challenge background without blending in? How do you challenge foreground without being so far removed? How do you challenge figure ground without considering the ground? How do you challenge architecture without a conversation with Tom Wiscombe? Tom, it's always a pleasure talking to you, and thank you for sitting down with me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, can you take us back to what you believe was your first architectural project? You mean in the sense of uh, project on my own, project of architecture? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, that's, that's difficult in, in my case because I, um, my career kind of has two phases, and I began by working for Wolf Pricks uh, when I was younger. And I, uh, I think all in all, I worked probably longer for Wolf than I've had an office on my own, which is kind of interesting. Uh, although it's starting to equalize more and more now. So, so what I consider um, my, my, first, uh, my first work, I would say my, my, the first work that really resonated and where I felt comfortable with it in my office uh, was, the, uh, was the Czech National Archive project. Um, or I guess you could go back further and go back to the PS1, the MoMA PS1 Urban Beach project. Uh, um, actually, I would, I, would, I would say that one. That one was done uh, well uh, uh, as a kind of hobby project, but well, I was, I was working for Wolf, and, um, but I, th I would say that PS1 is the, was a, a, a crucial project, and I don't think I knew it at the time. I know it now, and it's quite interesting. Now we're, d we're doing a monograph, and uh, the project still seems relevant in terms of a lineage of projects that I'm interested in talking about these days in terms of our work. Uh, some projects you find, once you have done over about 50 projects, you find that some are less relevant in terms of the lineage that you want, um, that, that you want to talk about, and others just fall away. And, and that one still sticks uh, for the reason that it was based on using some pseudo-primitives like diamonds and dealing with the issue of containment or containers, which is something I'm really, really interested in. I've been thinking more and more of architecture recently in terms of the container-contained relation. I'm noticing more and more that everything that we do that I like has an angle on that subject. And PS1 uh, did that, interestingly. It was like a panini where you took a, an, a two skins from the top and the bottom and you, you sort of paninied, paninied it. Um, so in, in that case, the, uh, we used a, a material in two different orientations. The, the diamonds were clad with perforated aluminum in one direction so that you could light them from the inside and they would appear to be mass. And then the outer skin was clad in the opposite direction so that it would, at nighttime, it would appear to go transparent. So it was a nice effect because day to night went from mass, whole mass object to parts at night. So, so part masses to whole mass during the day. And, uh, and it's one of those things that, you know, looking, looking at the work that we're doing now, uh, I'd say that we're, we're moving more and more towards parts and, and away from the holes. But it's something that I, that I definitely, um, it definitely resonates with me still. So I think, that, yeah, that was an important one. Your work has many stages or evolutions from semi-biomimicry to surface treatment and onto the status of the object. Could you shed light on what causes these shifts? I, I, think, um, I think it's a myth that architects have um, a single idea in their lifetimes. Uh, if you look at Le Corbusier, uh, um, it's quite interesting to look at his, his manifesto in Towards a New Architecture and his five points and his three reminders. 
and and you look at how that was very that was it was crucial in establishing the international style, which then reigned for 50 odd years. And uh, but what it didn't do is in any way give information of of why he would end up doing Ronchamp or Firmini later on in his career. And that's what interests me so much about about um, architects. That I think it's much closer to the arts in general than we than we think. We allow artists to have periods in their careers. They go through the you know Picasso goes through the blue period. Um, uh, architects do the same thing. I think though that a lot of architects feel under pressure to have a consistent uh, so-called project with a capital P throughout from the beginning day of their career until the end. Uh, I don't know why that is exactly, why we feel that pressure. I certainly don't feel that pressure. I feel like I want to have freedom. I want to develop. I want to get, I, wa I want to uh, try out new things. Uh, I insist every summer that we do a, um, a, a research project, which is either in the form of competition or, 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 or even just right now, something that we're doing which is just purely speculative. Uh, because I want to make sure that, that, uh, that we don't start copying ourselves ever and um, and that that the discussion keeps changing so now I would I would also like to say that at the same time you know we're doing a monograph right now and at the same time I am super interested in tying together what we have been doing the last few years uh, into a coherent statement about architecture and about and about my interests that's not to say it will be forever it's not a forever statement it's also not going to cover all of my ideas that I've had to date in architecture it will cover a period and it will hopefully um, cover it well enough that it will either rocket us towards a whole new level of working on that same subject, or we'll be able to close it off, bracket it out, and move on to new territories of working. I don't know yet. We have to do the thing first, um, the book. But, but I, again, just to, back to my original statement, I really I feel like architects often find that there has to be this, that there's this essential project that you are born with and you must execute it throughout your life um, until you hit the coffin. And I don't think that's the reality of how architects work or think. It's interesting that you talk about periods as this is the next question. In previous conversations, you said that theories have a timestamp and they are eventually exhausted and become jargon. It's a, is this a personal attitude towards it or do you think it applies to the discipline at large? I said that? <laughs> no, I, I agree with it. I just I'm not sure I said it, but um, let's say I did. Uh, I, yeah, I think I think that is true. And so, yeah, based on what I just said, um, I do think that that architects are always on the search or the quest for for relevancy in their time. I don't think that you can ever tap into a, a, a universal zeitgeist. I think that would be a bad thing to try to do. I think the minute you would get your hands around it, it would disappear and be gone. Um, uh, but, but I do think that, uh, that, that either what you're working on is relevant in its time or it's not. And it's, again, it's not that if you're not relevant now, you won't ever be. You, you, relevance comes and goes, just like I, you know, architectural ideas comes and, uh, come, uh, that come and go. But uh, I mean, I, I like to think that that in order to be relevant, you have to have your you have to have your finger on the pulse of architecture, but also fields outside of architecture like the arts, film, other things to kind of understand what uh, what's fresh. Um, and you also have to think understand that if you follow every single thing that's fresh, your 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 ability to produce something of merit will be diminished because you'll be chasing it. You'll be cool hunting. So, so I definitely don't do that. I keep, I, keep my, you know, I keep my ears open. I keep my eyes open. I like, to, I like to constantly add to what we're working on. But part of me also just instinctively wants to shutter the doors of the office and just work for a couple of years and, and not listen. And that, maybe that's the key to relevance, like not constantly jumping into the flow of information and, and mining it, but actually stopping for a minute. And uh, um, I always tell this story about, about Marcel Duchamp, which I don't know if I've told you this before, but, but I, I, was, um, I was really, really interested in Marcel Duchamp when I was an undergrad at Berkeley. And one of the, one of the most mysterious stories about him was that, was that he, he insisted that when, well, you know, you know, originally he was a pointillist. 
Okay, and then he became the Duchamp that we know and talk about now. And when he made that transition, he insists that he stopped going to any gallery shows in Paris, which was unheard of at the time because there was a huge community there. And, a, you know, and, and he, said, he said the only way he could move forward in art was to, was to stay in his studio and work and not look at anything else that any other cultural practitioners were doing. Now, I think it's a hoax, and I don't think that that's what happened. I don't have evidence one way or the other, but I think it's a super interesting idea that he would want to say that and believe it, whether or not it's true. So, so, I mean, I think you can't just be sniffing around. You can't be cool hunting. I think that would be detrimental um, to what you're working on. You have to give it time to, to grow. You have to experiment with things. You have to follow things down the rabbit hole. Uh, things that don't seem logical at all, like something like this. I don't think I would have found this by, by doing a Google search. We just, this just came out of us working on these strange figures that we've been working on. Uh, we decided one day we wanted to have a ziggurat combined with a diamond. I don't think you find that by shopping around online for ideas. <laughs> you just kind of invent it. So, so I'm, I don't think you can shutter yourself off, but I think if you don't sometimes, I think you're done. It's interesting that you talk both about art and architecture. So you, the idea of interdisciplinary and the idea of inter-architecturality that Jeff Kipnis talks about. How do you balance between looking at various disciplines and bringing them back in versus looking at colleagues and architects as uh, inspiration to the work or a way of looking at different things? Yeah. Well, I mean, I consider myself very lucky to be in a, um, uh, to be teaching at, at SciArc right now because it's, um, it's not, it's not just about teaching at this point, it's a whole community. And, um, and I, I think that um, many of my most important peers are there right now at that school. And, um, and, and I think that's, uh, it's a gift. It's a gift to have people who are working on similar things, but in a different way, to have people to, to basically develop discourse with. Um, I think that's really, really important. So in a way, I think, I think that's a huge part of what teaching is all about, is, is having the closeness and, and developing something kind of in parallel to other people interested in similar issues, but doing it in a different way. Um, so uh, so that's, that's crucial. Now, you were asking about interdisciplinarity and... Interarchitecturality. Inter Interarchitecturality, which sounds to me like disciplinarity. Yeah. So. So that's really crucial. Going to symposia is crucial. Discussing ideas, um, getting the work out there in the form of writing is becoming more important to me because writing requires of you uh, a little bit of distance from the work. You're not in it every day. So very, very important for me in terms of, the, of maturing, maturing the work. Um, and I find the, the older I get, the more I want to look at architecture and the less I want to look at all different kinds of disciplines. So, so I would say earlier on in my career, I looked much more outside, I looked much more outside. Now, um, the book that we're doing uh, uh, has been an interesting adventure because I have a giant repository of analogies and things that are inspiring to me that are both inside of architecture and outside. And, and deciding which ones make the cut and which ones don't is, is a huge, it's a, it's a huge learning experience and it's a big decision for me. It's probably one that no one would ever notice or know, um, except the people working on it with me. Um, but, but it definitely, I think it's, uh, I just am finding more and more that I want to, you know, what we, our, the big board here is, is really important for the design process. Whatever's on the big board is, is, I mean, maybe not today because this is a presentation, but, but normally the big board has, you know, any number of things on it, but I'm noticing that the big board has more and more architectural precedents on it than maybe before, you know. And then every once in a while something like a cornucopia. <laughs> so. Your work is theory driven, but the resultant projects are not theoretical or conceptual. I wanted to quote you on something. You said you can't have architecture without theory. You can have buildings, but not architecture. And you call some doubt on the idea of the theoretical architect. How do you balance between understanding theory and the advance, advancement of applied theory? This is a complicated question, a very good one. Um, how do you, I don't know if balance, I don't know if any goal of mine would be a balance of anything, um, but uh, I, I mean, I really can only speak for myself. You know, there, there are all different factions who would answer this question in radically different ways. There are the new conceptualists, 
um, who are interested in uh, uh, in uh, in the reintroduction of extreme disciplinarity and drawing and, and the super fundamentals of architecture. There, um, there's another group interested in a complete division of uh, theoreticians and architects. Um, there, there is the way that we're doing it at SciArc now, which is to try to fuse design and theory into a single way of thinking about architecture, which is more my, my point of view. Um, I don't. Th I think. I think that some distance from the work is crucial. However, I don't think the distance from the work means literally that you you can't you can't mix design and theory. I think that every time we design something, we're theorizing something. At the end of the day, um, now is it the responsibility of the architect to both design you know like this thing to design this object and then theorize it? No. I think it can become very explainy very quickly in the sense of like. I may feel, if, if I feel responsible to theorize every single thing that I make, I think it can become problematic very quickly in the sense that I may feel like I have to, I have to uh, justify or argue for every single move that was made, and I might end up reducing the, the, the power of the object itself into some kind of theoretical um, uh, list of do's and don'ts. So, so I, I, I really believe it's not necessary for architects to write. Um, I think it's really valuable when, when, uh, when, uh, when theorists write and talk about your work. I mean, I, I, I really enjoy that. Um, I, but for me, I also I notice that I just the way that I am. I need I need to write, and I and it helps me clarify what we're actually working on. Um, but I would never want to explain it in full. I like a little bit of the allure and mystery of the thing not being fully um, explainable. I don't really believe that anything, anything in the arts or architecture is fully explainable. I don't think you can ever have full knowledge of, of, a, piece, of a piece of cultural production when done well. So like, I would be really against sitting here you know, pointing out all the details here and, and taking it apart back into its con constituent parts and saying like, why we would make such a thing and why it's relevant and just sort of top to bottom. I'd much rather that you, um, you sort of encounter this object without previous knowledge of it and you have to come to terms with it in the sense that you, you might not quite know what you're dealing with and it might keep your attention. You have no explanation for it. It needs none and it might increase its durability in the fact that you don't have any inf any further information about it except what's present in the object itself. You operate in a world of spectra and pseudo statements. It's hmm. near this and slightly that. This brings a whole series of new terminology to the work and the discipline. Are you trying to find words that are vague or not too precise to liberate the work from linguistics? Uh, yes. I am, in fact. I, I, I like very much language that does not try to turn architecture into science. Um, Any time we, we reduce works of art or works of architecture into, um, into parts or ideas or diagrams or th things of that nature, I think that we, we ultimately harm, we harm the work. Um, so. Well, I, I, I didn't fully, your question was quite long. Sorry if I missed it. Um, are you trying to find words that are vague or yeah. not too precise to yes. liberate? Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, um, you got my number on that one. I mean, I, I, I enjoy making up words. I enjoy redefining words for my own use. You know that I've, I've made up uh, several words that are just made up words. And it's funny sometimes when I hear them back from others as if they're actual words. You know, meta seams would be one. Uh, I only think of that one, or, or super components, or that one, because I'm literally sitting in front of a super component that happens to also have meta seams on it. Of course, those are not words. And super components is a, a particularly fun one for me because it seems to erase itself. Uh, the idea of something being super or above would imply that it's that it's that it's um, hierarchically above its components. So when I call something a super component, a component sounds small, right? And something super would be above the component. So what's a super component? It's, it's, it's a slight contradiction. I'm aware of this. 
uh, but, but it has to do with my interest in new, completely new ideas about part-to-whole relationships. Uh, for instance, that Graham Harmon and Levy Bryant talk about, uh, Levy Bryant calls it a strange Mariology. The idea that something can both be an object and be a part of another object simultaneously. It's a bit of a mind bender, but I like it because it's a play on something that isn't just about philosophy or ontology, but it's something that, that, that um, links back into a long architectural disciplinary thread, part to whole. So I think it's super interesting that we could look at philosophy right now and, and pull, out, pull out a set of ideas, strange Mariologies, and apply them back to um, what we assume to be um, uh, uh, contemporary models of part to whole. So yeah, I like to make up words. You refer to yourself as someone who likes things that are ancient, yet you don't tie yourself to the historic part of the discourse. Can we describe you as a contemporary ancient or a new ancient? <laughs> no, <laughs> please don't do that. Um, no, I'm not a contemporary ancient. I, I do, I will say this, uh, we have this discussion around the office a lot these days, and the reason why I'm, I'm holding this, this thing is that, is that I have tired of the computer in its, in, its, in its uses over the last decade. I have tired of, of ideas about um, ultra refinement and um, high fidelity uh, uh, um, geometry and high fidelity renders and all kinds of things like that. And I'm definitely getting interested in what I call the chunky or the low res or the, you know, you know, going full Egyptian, you know, go, going back into ziggurats. Uh, um, and this is, as you can tell, this is, not, th this is not me unearthing the history of the ziggurat. That's not my intention. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a statement about form. I'm making a statement about forms that I find fresh and interesting and relevant for, for this time, which I believe is the, the first few years of the post-digital era. So. Keeping on track with the question on history, when we look closely at your projects, we don't see much use of traditional architectural elements, as well as you don't just transform the envelope, but the entire building. Could you maybe elaborate on the importance of erasing these elements from your buildings? Can you say that again? I didn't get that. Which Keep, elements? Like, uh, his, like the traditional elements of a column, a party, um, a corridor. They don't exist in your project as they have come in the discipline in the past. It's a new way of interpreting them. So how important is it to re reinterpret them or erase them from your buildings? Yeah, that, uh, uh, I like that question. Uh, okay, so here's what I would say. Um, one thing that I think a lot about is this idea, which relates to part to whole, um, is the idea of subdivisions of things. Can things, can, can objects be subdivided in any way? Can they be subdivided in any way? We constantly in architecture talk about subdivisions. We're subdividing uh, um, volumes into rooms. We're subdividing building envelopes into panels. We're always, we're always interested in subdivisions. And, and I've been fighting against that instinct to subdivide things in the office. And um, so it's led, it's led me to, to, for instance, release the idea of, of, of subdividing in plan, subdividing a mass or a volume into rooms by actually liberating each room and turning it into kind of autonomous, autonomous pieces and parts. So, so then that led me to start to think about building skins as well and how could I, how could I have some, some kind of subdivision that would go beyond the material limits of, for instance, uh, panelization and still have subdivisions, but not where the div it's a reductive impulse to take something very large and complex and subdivide it into little pieces, which is, a, which is reductionism, but rather divide things into, into uh, smaller objects. So larger objects are divided into smaller objects. So let's say you have a container. You don't, you don't break it up with rooms and walls. You break it up by having um, nested spaces inside of it, which are, which are independent entities. Or you make a super component. Uh, this is a subdivision of an, of an envelope. So this is not a panel. This is not based on a grid or a grid system or a mesh or even a, um, a known method of, um, of industrial production. But it is a type of sub subdivision. But the, uh, the object itself 
has, um, has qualities. It's not that the subdivisions are subservient to the whole. Each, each one of its parts um, has, its own, has its own qualities. So, uh, so yeah, I am, I, am, I am against the corridor. Uh, I am, I like, I'm very interested in suppressing circulation in buildings in general, which is something also we talk about in the office a lot. Uh, why? Because I think it's a constant referent back to the human, the human scale. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to scuttle issues of scale and create mystery through uh, scale and determinant architecture. Um, and yeah, room to me is not a room, it's a, it's a, it's an object inside of another object. I think after a long time, the conversation of discipline versus practice has been put to rest. However, you've created a new separation within the discipline when you talk about not confusing architectural affect with problem solving. Could you clarify that? Not uh, architectural affect with problem solving. Well, I don't, listen, I can only say this. Uh, I don't really, and this is, this is almost a cliche at this point, but I don't think that what we do has anything to do with problem solving as architects. I really don't. Um, that's not to say that that you know I won't sit down and do you know you know do some space planning you know because we have to do that too. But I really don't think that's 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 our role. Um, I, I do believe that is the role of engineering, and it's crucial that engineers play that role. Um, but I don't think that's what we do in architecture. Um, I, I align what we do with the um, with the the arts uh, the uh, the arts and humanities, and not with the sciences. Um, so, so yeah, I think, you know, if you're interested in affect, uh, um, I think that sounds like something that would be something that architects can, can, uh, can deal with. Uh, problem solving, I, I don't really think that, that way. And, and I'll just tell you how I, how I would start a project in general. Uh, I'd almost never start a project by drawing a diagram of its organization. I almost never start a project by drawing uh, a, uh, any kind of diagrammatic information on the object's relation to its local context. I will almost always start a project with, uh, with a very precise formal agenda. And that's why I really like to use this menagerie, which is a kind of, it's a kind of, that's my ancient history of everything that we're working on in the office that we can draw from. It's like a well, and we draw from it for different projects. But, but uh, we will always start with one of those, or, or something like this, and never with items that need to be solved, or items that can be diagrammed. That leads me right to the next question. The words autonomy and context, or lack of context, are often brought up in relationship to your work. How does your approach to do those two things differ than the way that the discourse has approached them in the past? Um, I would, s I, for me, context is extremely vexing. I would not say that I have a thoroughly worked out position in terms of context, which is why I think that I've developed a kind of trick to get out of that problem, which is, um, which is, which is ground. So I've been dealing a lot with having architecture relate to ground in very particular ways, uh, either by hovering or hovering over a hole or sitting in a hole or press, pressing into the ground um, or having a moat, or all of these different ways that architecture can relate to ground. But I, the minute it involves very particular um, things to do with the local context, like the contingencies of uh, literally of like of like the local history of a context, um, I get I get I get vexed very quickly. And however, by vexed I mean I mean deeply uh, interested and thinking about it. And I don't mean indifferent. So it's something that I am very interested in. I think that new models of context are super important in the next for the next few years. I think we need to find ways of uh, new new ways of of being contextual without being literally contextual. So uh, I don't know what that is yet. You know, I'll let you know when I know. But but uh, but definitely, I'm interested in the way that that architecture interfaces with its ground. Uh, and um, and I would also like to point out that that I'm I'm very I, I'm very little interested in landscape right now. And um, generally, when I talk about ground, I'm talking about the architecturalized ground that which is 
under the control and design of the architect and not, and not some idea about nature where the building comes to rest. So, so by ground, I mean something that, that the architect is dealing with. The first separation from inside and outside created a real thing from nature and world. You now have inside of the inside, outside of the inside, etc. Most of the time, your sections belong uniquely to you. They can only happen because of a trick you're playing. Could you talk a bit about that and whether the section is an end result of the design process or a tool to develop a project? Good. Um, I'd, say, I'd say I think sectionally. However, I, uh, I don't think that I would generally draw a section or that that would proceed. We, we always work three-dimensionally. Um, drawing in 2D per se is, it has never been generative in my office. Uh, we always make mass. We concentrate on mass. So uh, when we want to understand something sectionally, we'll slice it open and look at it. Uh, however, that's not to say it's accidental how the section turns out. We, we know, based on the, 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 the objects and their relationship to one another, we know, we know how it's going to work. Um, let me show you a project that we're working on right now. I'll come back in the frame in a second. Can I have, the, can I have that one? Thank you. So, so this is uh, something we're working on right now. I don't know if I'm totally out of the frame at this point or what, but uh, I'll just share it with you. Whoops. Well, OK, it's not sitting very well on its ground. <laughs> but um, so this, this is a project where, where we're, we're really taking on this idea of the container, again, in full force. But we're playing with, uh, and this, the reason why I grabbed this model is because we built, we made this entire design out of this one figure. Um, hard to tell, right? Because we're, what we're doing is combining figures in such a way and slicing on them in order that they remain parts and the parts are identifiable through joints and through just floating in space. But, uh, but at the same time, there is some way of understanding this thing as a whole new object. Okay? And the most important thing about this particular design right now is that the objects are both inside and outside the container. And when we slice the objects, they actually become the container. So, the, so th what was inside is now part of the perimeter envelope of the building, sometimes. Other times, it's sticking out of the container. So it's not part of the container, but it's, a, it's an escaping figure. And then other times, the figure is fully in the interior. So this is, this is, the, next, this is the next level and something that we're working on. Um, uh, I'm very excited about it. Many architects have a bias towards the representational methods, whether it's sketching, drawing, or animation. What do you consider as your primary way of representing your ideas? Uh, I definitely do sketch by hand. I, um, I sketch abstractly, however. I don't like to sketch images of buildings. I like to sketch very open-endedly. Um, uh, and those are, those are crucial for me. And they're crucial for me just communicating with, with the people in the office. But, I will say this, I don't work, I, 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 I never sit down on a computer anymore and design these projects. Um, I never do that. Uh, I always work with people who do that with me, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, actually, it's actually, it's not by accident, it's crucial for me to have distance from the work that I have people obsessively working on it, but that I can always have distance and I can look at it. So I will communicate with people in the office, yeah, through sketches and by giving feedback directly on the computer, um, on the computer screen. But I, I myself, uh, um, uh, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm in the business of, of making architectural representation, if you know what I mean. Like, I'm not drawing a section. I, you know, I sketch. I don't model either. I don't render. Um, but. But I will say that, again, I, I think you, you know, what you brought up a second ago, I think uh, drawings for me are of little interest. They, are, they never have been. Physical models are crucial for, for the environment in the office. 
We make many, many, many versions of models. Usually we make very small ones first. Uh, we'll make about 20 of those for a project and then we'll scale up. And now we have this scale and we've got about 10 of these. And then the next scale up, we'll do one, but it'll be gigantic. Um, but I work in models. I, I trust models. And I have a growing distrust of, of renderings, especially photorealistic renderings. I find them to be ineffective. Um, not only not relevant, really, because you can hire out amazingly photoreal renders now, uh, but I find them also to be, uh, to kind of falsify the, uh, all the aspects of the object. So I really like to have, I like to have, to have the thing in the room with us. The move from the graphic effect to a more material effect is a recent interest of yours. How could you, uh, how does this change the way you work, your work is perceived and what effect are you trying to create? Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I, uh, I am very interested in creating masses that have some level of ambiguity to them. And we have used several different, um, I mean, part of our repertoire here is, is, is pretty wide. We've been using, um, been using what I call tattoos in order to um, create a secondary or a secondary reading of a mass, um, which, which I still like to do and I'm very interested in. We've used uh, um, reflections of, of outside objects on another object in order to create patterns on there, which may, again, not, uh, not behave properly in regards to the mass, but give you, give you potential secondary readings of the mass. Um, and, uh, and I'm still very interested in all of that. And all I'm trying to do now with the, with the particularities of, for instance, recently of, of gloss black, matte black, and mirror chrome, which is something I'm very interested in, um, is, is, to, is to stop thinking about graphics as graphics, but start to think about graphics as inlaid materials. So it's really quite simple. It's, it's that I, I've always thought of the graphics as being, of being materials, like one material pressed into another, in order to create a complex envelope. It's never been about um, texture mapping or putting images on surfaces. I'm not interested in that. So that's why even part of, part of when I talk about tattoos, part of the idea always is that, is that it's, it's, inlaying, it's inlaying one thing into another thing. So there's the ability to separate it. It's not, it's not textures on surfaces, so yeah. To elaborate on the idea that you're talking about uh, of misreading, there is a very unique approach to the way you deal with perimeter, edge, and silhouette. Could you describe how they work together or if they work together in context of your projects? Yeah, I'm, I'm hugely interested in that in all of those things. I, I'm uh, not sure if I can entirely define the difference between all three of those terms, but, but yes, silhouette I find extremely interesting, especially when applied not only to the external building form, but also to interior objects. So the interplay between uh, between inner objects having a particular silhouette and outer objects having a different one is, is, a, is a really interesting effect that I, I always, I find it to be a sort of classic one uh, around here in the office that, that I really like. Um, I would say that, uh, that the introduction of things like this, like the stepping or the ziggurating and some of the figures that we're using has everything to do with, with trying to um, create stoppages in the eye so that, you're, so that we don't have things that seem to be coherent or smooth, but that you have blockages or breakages in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in, in the reading of the silhouette. So again, you know, in this, in this particular project, you have the breakage in the sense of like actual breakages, giant joints that are completely out of scale and have nothing to do with tectonics in the, in the piece. But then you have at the same time a kind of very strange stepping, which doesn't, it isn't a ziggurat. It's, it's, a, it's leaning in such a way that it's sort of, it's an awkwardly leaning ziggurat. Um, and, it, and the way that it's chopped off to create a very particular figure here is crucial. So we'll cut this 20 times until we get it right. So I'm interested in the silhouette of the individual elements of a design, but then also the overall silhouette and that, that feedback between the two. It's something we've been working on in many, many projects. I'd like to end by asking you a more fun and relaxed question about mystery and complexity. In the current architecture you're exploring, can something be too mysterious to the extent where it's no longer mysterious? For example, something that is too black where it becomes blacked out is then nothing but black. 
Let's end on the world you have created thus far, from fa near, far from facts and nearer to fiction. That's great, Zaid. So, okay, uh, I like that point very much. I think uh, incoherence is not mystery. Those are not the same thing. That's just incoherence. <laughs> uh, mystery is that thing which will, over a long period of time, draw out your perception. Um, it will be durable. It will be something that you return to again and again. Um, and you see that in the, in the, in, in the most important architecture of the world, um, uh, that it does that. Uh, so I think there is, it's not just a fine line between incoherence or complication and mystery. I'd say they have nothing to do with one another. Mystery is something that, that you, you, you control very precisely as the, as the architect. Um, I like that black, using black versus blacking out. I think that's very interesting. Um, uh, black is, a, is, a is an interesting topic right now because there are, I think there are, I don't know if there's an actual discourse on black yet, but maybe there should be because there are enough people interested in it. Um, but I'm not interested in the disappearance of the architectural object. I am not. I, I, am, I am very interested in, in strong silhouettes um, of, of architecture. I am interested in the way that materials and patterns and tattoos be, can begin to obs uh, obscure or give a second reading to strong form. But I wouldn't be interested in weak form that is then that is blacking out of form and then in addition to that literally going black on it. So I think I, I think uh, um, that's maybe maybe one thing that would differentiate my my approach to mystery or this whole discussion of ambiguity and those kinds of things. That I want to I want to start with something strong and then I want to erode erode away at it. Listen too carefully to Tom and you might not get it. Don't listen to Tom and you might be missing out something crucial. Tom, <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ed.